Thank you, um, Dr. Halford, Linky, Chris, Rod, Marath, and the whole leadership talk team for this opportunity. I really appreciate it. I know that everyone has been going through a tough time and these conversations and these moments that we can share our stories kind of give us some hope that we will go back to normalcy at some point. Um, Today, I'll be talking about a bit of my passions, how I got into the wildlife world, into the wildlife crime world, but predominantly because it's Women's Month in the leadership talks this month, I'll be talking about the very unique aspect of women's roles in the illegal wildlife trade and how I came to discover this, how my, the first encounter with it, but also talking a little bit about the, giving you a bit of context about my research that Dr. Telfer talked about with regards to research in South Africa and Ethiopia and the Horn of Africa and the broader context and sensitivities of history, neocolonialism, race, culture, gender, hierarchies and power that obviously influence all of these aspects within the wildlife trade. Um, thank you everyone that's in, um, already taken the Zoom uh, poll, but if you haven't, please do now. I won't be sharing anybody's um, responses, so to speak, but it will help you think about later when we're engaging in questions if your mind and your opinions about women's engagement in crime has shifted at all and maybe if if you're thinking of questions while i'm going through my talk because there's quite a lot of context uh, please write it down and don't be afraid to to ask me later. Also, before I start, I want to shout out to my intern, Emma, which I think is on the, on the Zoom today, um, for helping me with this presentation at short notice. So thank you, Emma. I really appreciate you. Um, and let's get right into it. So how it all began. My name is Greta, and I am Ethiopian-Italian, and I spent a majority of my life in Ethiopia. And I believe I was very lucky to thanks to my parents and my mother and father on the call today so they can testify, um, to discover a lot of Ethiopia's wild spaces and spend a lot of my time in the outdoors, which really greatly influenced my passion for the outdoors. And even at a young age, I was able to see and understand the challenges there was between nature, wildlife, communities, and development. Some of the things that we're still struggling to find balance in in the world of today. Um, these are some pictures from my upbringing that I hold very dear, but it shows you that this is a very privileged way of engaging with wildlife, with nature, with the outdoors. And having had been exposed to that at such a young age, but also seeing that the communities that we were engaging with obviously didn't engage with nature in the same way. And this always remained with me as I grew older and as I started pursuing my career and the passion that I wanted to study. So here are some images from the very first place that I spent my career in, which is the Simi Mountains National Park in the north of Ethiopia. And it is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And Nick Crane is on the call as well, um, as he owned the first lodge in the Simi Mountains. Before working for Nick, I was conducting some research really to try and understand the imbalances and the interactions between nature, wildlife, people, and development, and really the fundamental challenges in finding a balance between all of these things. Ethiopia is, is the second most populous um, country in, on the continent. And because of that, wildlife and nature has never really been a priority for the country. And this can be seen in the way that parks are managed. And my time in the Simians really exposed me to the great challenges that there are when it comes to underfunded parks, uh, when communities are not benefiting from these protected areas, the likes of fortress conservation as we know it, where we put nature on one side and humans on the other. And this in itself brings so many uh, issues such as competition for nature um, and, and resources, human wildlife conflict, and then conflict between stakeholders. I became really passionate about trying to understand better the struggle over control of and access to natural resources. These images that I've put here, you can see really clearly 
on the on the top right hand corner you would see some villas with nice green spaces and um, probably more wealthy communities a nice park that separates it and kind of creates an idyllic area and then the shanty towns and people obviously living in far smaller spaces with a, a let's say lesser quality of life than the people on this side and then in this image we see pristine nature on the left what we talk, think about as pristine forests and what we love when we think about engaging with wildlife, this is what we think of. And then on the right, we see some form of development, some form of destruction. But when you think about it, this could be uh, making way for a new park, uh, like a, a water park or a, a resort or a factory or a farm, all things that contribute to our consumption and the way that we engage with life, also things that we need. So this struggle, really became very obvious to me and how resources are really defined and influenced very much by the market the social markers of our life so race gender ethnicity class your wealth and power we're all going to be things that define how you engage with nature how you engage with your livelihoods and your resources there's a quote that i really like that I had come across when I was studying this at the very beginning of my career, which is by Zimmerman in 1951. He said, resources are not, resources become. And what essentially that means is that when you have an endless abundance of a resource, you don't really value it. So if a river is constantly flowing and you have access to it constantly, you might not um, appreciate that river. You might take it for granted. But as soon as that river is dammed or as soon as that river becomes something you no longer have access to, all of a sudden there's conflict. It's politicized. It's difficult. And so in order to understand wildlife conservation, I understood that I had to understand the shortcomings of conservation practices and understand how protected areas came to be and how communities were now considered the pest or the problem and wildlife and this pristine nature was everything that we needed to protect. So looking at history, colonialism, um, the, the rhetoric that the trophy hunter was hunting for sport while the bushmeat hunter is hunting for survival, but yet we all know who is the condemned one, even in the wildlife trade. So how society is divided and the conditioning of how we perceive problems really became something that I became very passionate about. And at the time, it wasn't being spoken about as much as it is now. Um, so when I went on to do my postgraduate research, I was fascinated by the legal wildlife trade because it was a far more Grab, graspable topic rather than conservation as a, as a whole, which is very broad. And illegal wildlife trade allowed me to pinpoint in one segment of conservation. And I started, um, I became fascinated with the rhino because in Ethiopia, rhinos have been extinct for a very long time. And with the last, um, let's say, sighting of rhino being in 1982, they seemed like this mythical creature to me that I'd never seen. And in the year that I was conducting my research in 2014, the rhino horn trade was, was at the peak of a problem. It was being spoken about by all media, everyone, even those that had never heard of rhinos, never engaged in South Africa, had heard about, heard about the problems of the rhino horn trade. So I decided to study and look into this. It really fascinated me that the rhino horn trade catapulted the rise of militarization in private anti-poaching units in South Africa. And all, a lot of people on this call today are based in South Africa and they'll remember this period where there was really quite a lot of um, private, there was this kind of propaganda for the need for private anti-poaching units. And as someone that had been raised in Ethiopia where a lot of the park management and especially anti-poaching was conducted at central federal level, it really fascinated and confused me as well. So I definitely wanted to delve deeper into the, is the, the challenges and the issues that this might cause to one, the rhino horn trade itself, but also the communities living on the outskirts of these parks and these spaces. Long story short, ultimately the research exposed that the harsh reality is that militarization and let's say segregation of people from nature was actually perpetrating the illegal wildlife trade. It was, create, it was alienating communities and creating resentments towards the park. This poacher versus anti-poacher 
situation, this, these perceptions that we are creating about the poacher being the main issue when it came to the illegal wildlife trade, rather than looking at the broader spectrum um, from the traders, the traffickers, the middlemen, the corrupt officials, the buyers and the consumers, all of that seemed to have been missed when all the marketing and branding around the world and the perceptions we were giving is that the poacher was the main problem. So it was reproducing inequalities such as apartheid, furthering racial biases, and more importantly, it wasn't actually saving rhinos. So these are images that at the time, while I was doing my research, this caricature here was at the was like reproduced online many, many times. And as you can see, the rhino, essentially it's trying to show, convey that the rhino is taking advantage, or taking revenge on the poacher, clearly a black man. But we're not taking into consideration that there's so many races are involved in the illegal wildlife trade. So this was causing for me a misconception of what the realities were. And therefore we were creating interventions that weren't actually going to resolve the problem. So after that, I started delving way deeper into the perceptions and the conditioning and the environmental injustices that take place when we create conservation programs and trying to better understand how our perceptions really inform our interventions and how for once I wanted to take myself out as a privileged individual to try and understand it from the perspective of the poacher from the local community as well as the perception of the westerner and the judgments of how an African poacher or a Western poacher would be looked at completely different. And of course, this in itself is such a deep topic that can be, that another talk can be done on. So I just wanted to put this slide here to, to touch on it and give some context. So, um, and also while I was in Baluli, I was there when the Black Mampa anti-poaching unit was kind of just beginning and it's nascent faces and and Craig Spencer who was the brainchild or the father of the Bambas was very adamant about how he wanted a non-militarized approach and I found this fascinating because the issues in South Africa with the rhino horn were very very dangerous and very militarized therefore I didn't understand how this was going to work but he had explained to me that he believed that there was a real power in including women from the local communities, from the communities surround, in the surrounding areas to shift perception, to recognize the importance of integrating gender into the conservation in interventions because women hold really important roles within their communities, despite not being given the credit. And not only do the, did he prove this after six years, the Bambas are still going strong and they have an amazing talk on the leadership talk. So do watch it if you haven't um, and how they are even preserving during COVID-19. But not only did they make effective scouts and guards and reduce rhino poaching in the region, they're also huge role models and influencers in the communities that they come from. And now in the world, the whole world has heard about the, the Black Mambas. They've been featured on magazines and um, interviews and movies and all these things have been made about them. So the amount of power that they have just from visible policing, community outreach and raising awareness, really challenging gender stereotypes. So considering how Craig had already visualized this and by amplifying the voice of the woman, he was creating caregivers for future generations, but also creating whistleblowers and leaders in the fight against wildlife crime which nobody at the time was really doing so after my time in south africa i went back home to ethiopia and i you know took everything that i had learned and i wanted to understand better in the context of ethiopia and the region of the horn and eritrea uh, where i was from it's a completely different context to south africa um, in the horn tourism and wildlife economies are virtually non-existent other than in kenya and below the belt of ethiopia so trying to give value to something that wasn't benefiting pretty much anybody was going to be a challenge. And also parks and, and, and staff are very, very critically underfunded. And nobody is really benefiting so much from tourism on a, on a national scale. So this was really interesting for me because I wanted to see how, knowing everything that I knew now, how we could develop wildlife economies without making the same mistakes, without um, kind of stereotyping and missing the important links. And 
one of the biggest issues when I started my career is that habitats were being destroyed at a very rapid rate. Wildlife had been for many years already being decimated across the country. And just as an example of the elephants, which I started working with, 95% of elephant populations had been um, decimated by the time I started working there. So this seemed like a good place to start. Elephants are not endemic, of course, to Ethiopia, but they were the largest land mammal and the government, whether they liked it or not, was being forced to engage on the ivory um, crisis and the poaching crisis across the continent. So Ethiopia was mandated to develop their Ethiopian Elephant Action Plan and I was lucky enough to be able to get on, on this, this team that was developing this document. And really a lot of people were asking me within government, why elephants? Why aren't we trying to protect other animals, uh, the endemics and so on? And really it was more about having an in and making wildlife important. And I knew that because the elephant crisis was a global one, um, even if let's say passion fizzled out within government, they would have to still engage with me because of elephants. Not to mention they are a keystone species. They're very important for habitats. And I truly believe if you can protect elephant ranges and all the species, including humans that depend on that environment, then you can protect everything else. And ever since then, and over the last four years, these are kind of the four roles that I take, um, let's say full time in my, in my time working to end wildlife crime. I'm a special advisor to the Ethiopian Wildlife Authority and the Ethiopian Tourism Organization in Ethiopia. And this really has helped me a lot to have conversations outside of the wildlife arena. So being able to be brought into conversation when there's large investments uh, being planned so that we can discuss what the impact of that might be. I'm also the regional lead for the Horn of Africa for the EPI, uh, the Elephant Protection Initiative, and that includes South Sudan, Eritrea, Somalia. So regionally, it really allows me to bring in leaders from different countries because the legal wildlife trade is a global phenomenon. It is a regional phenomenon and engaging all the different um, regional leaders is so important to make any progress. And then as um, Dr. Paul mentioned, I'm also the technical advisor for Wildlife Conservation Society and on the management board of Born Free. With Born Free, we really deal with live pet exotic trade. So pet trade with regards to cheetah, lion cubs, and captive breeding programs that might be illegal. So really through my roles, I've been able to engage in all the different angles that might come into the world of the wildlife crime happening in and through Ethiopia. Notwithstanding, as a woman working in wildlife crime in a very male dominated arena, it hasn't been easy. And I don't think anybody working in wildlife conservation as a woman, um, we know that it isn't easy to get decision makers to listen, especially in the horn where conservation and wildlife is considered either a man's role through scouts and ranger programs, or just something a woman shouldn't be involved in. But nonetheless, I've been very stubborn and I have been making a lot of progress with regards to engaging the higher level um, decision makers as well as the lower level um, or like local site level leaders and regional chiefs and women. And now that I've given you some context and how I came to work in this world, I'll be sharing a lot more about the role of women specifically in interventions. So as I was working over the last five years with state engagement, interception and undercover work when it comes to illegal trafficking of, of ivory and all sorts of wildlife products like rhino horn skins, cheetah cubs and so on. Ivory management itself, so managing it on behalf of the government through an inventory system. And then of course, stakeholder engagement and conservation solutions on the ground. Conservation solutions really is dealing directly with communities, trying to resolve human wildlife conflict, trying to find compensation schemes or grants when an elephant has crop raided an entire um, community's food for the year, things like this. And I've highlighted two specific in green because these were really the areas in which I became exposed to the role of women and how they engage with the illegal wildlife trade and crime. So, what is the role of women in the illegal wildlife trade? I consider this one of the major, major blind spots in the literature and academia of 
um, wildlife trade and trafficking. It's not because it doesn't exist. It just hasn't been spoken about. It hasn't been focused on. And if you think about all of the articles you might have read, um, whether they're academic or just regular articles online, usually there, there's no gender dimension to the paper. We instantly assume a poacher, a trafficker, a consumer is a male, and that's how it's being dominated. And although women do Although men, of course, are leaders in that role, and we know this because they've been apprehended, and there's a lot of evidence of that. There is a lot of evidence, even from the short time that I've been conducting interception work, that women are just as involved, whether they're involved willingly or they're being coerced into the, the crimes, they are very much involved at all levels, and we'll look more into that. The biggest problem with downplaying the vital role that women play within the wildlife crime and the tra especially transnational organized crime is that we really are overlooking the power that women have in order to dismantle organized criminal networks from the inside out. Just like with the Black Mambas, the fact that we never included women as scouts and rangers up to five years ago, the fact that we're overlooking and kind of disregarding or ignoring the fact that women are leaders in wildlife crime as well um, means that we're not creating interventions that can have real impact and change the game. So what we don't know about the illegal wildlife trade is far more than what we do. And this is why there's a lot of information missing. There's also the fact that it is an illegal trade. So in order to gain information and accurate information and especially scientific evidence, you'd have to be engaging with criminals and you'd have to be engaging or kind of committing the crime yourself, which is why a lot of times when people ask me, well, why haven't you conducted scientific research? Well, it's because it's very difficult to prove something um, when it's so dangerous to gain information. And also speaking with those that are involved, especially women, um, can be challenging because they're afraid and anybody that is committing a crime doesn't want to admit that they are committing a crime if it means that they're going to be incarcerated or if there's consequences. Um, there's also a great misconception about communities in general that they're all um, ho homogeneous, that they all feel the same, that they all want to do good or do bad. And then this makes it very difficult because you have to take, it takes time to build trust. And and there we go. So, and so I want to share three different stories where I was exposed to directly as a, myself to how women are leaders and engaging in crime and also share a little bit about the different kinds of roles women might be playing. So the first one is the site level role. So I was conducting some work in a very remote area in Ethiopia, and I won't be sharing names or locations for safety of myself and the people that might have been involved when I was doing this work, but we were actually tracking elephants and trying to identify GPS locations of some of the biggest uh, human elephant conflict regions, and also trying to engage more with the communities to try and understand how to help them if it was if they wanted to voluntarily be uh, resettled if they wanted to cultivate different crops so that the elephants would stop being pests and crop breeding so as i was spending time there i think this on this trip i must have spent about two three weeks so it was a lot of time and we would only work let's say for four or five hours just because of the pure heat and the difficulty of working in the dense um, habitat and majority of the rest of the time i would spend with the women collecting firewood making food, collecting water, showering, making notes and so on. So I built a relationship with the women um, as I was the only woman with, uh, outside of the team that had come with me. And one evening after camp, I was tired and I wanted to head back to my tent. And as I was going, heading towards the tent, obviously really dark and it's just my flashlight, one of the women comes out of the bush and stops me. And I obviously was very startled and, and asked her what was happening, if everything was okay. And she told me that her brother was about, was being commissioned to poach a, a group of elephants in the next few weeks and that she had she had found out through the work that I was doing that that was wrong and that she didn't want him to do it because one it would go against the work that we were doing and also she was afraid afraid for the community and the repercussions and the scouts that were with us and what they might do to her brother this was very obviously a, a moment a light bulb moment for me but also a shocking moment for me because a woman here was a woman that was willing to compromise the safety of her brother 
by sharing this information with me to uphold the, the safety of the community, so of the collective and putting herself in danger to share this information with me. That was the first real encounter I had with women as defenders. So the whistleblowers going against their own kind, their own family. Then a few months later, or maybe a, a year or two later, actually, this was a bit later. This was when I was conducting more, let's say, dangerous or more risky work together with the federal police in Ethiopia and the intelligence departments. And we were conducting interceptive work. So over the years uh, working in wildlife crime, I have built a very, very strong team of informants and incredibly talented local community leaders and chiefs that will notify me when they know or hear of wildlife trafficking taking place within their communities or if there's a trade or a sale going on. And on this specific day, I was at the house and I got a call because usually I don't myself engage in the interceptive work because it's quite dangerous and also because of my um, identity, it's, it's known and it's, you know, it would, it would compromise the, the interceptive work and the success rate of, of intercepting without them realizing who we are. But that day, one of the people that usually poses as a buyer um, couldn't make it and something happened in their personal life. And this was a case that we'd been working on for weeks at this point. And we knew that this sale was going to take place on this day and everything was ready. But if the buyer was not gonna be there, then we wouldn't be able to intercept. And because of how much was at stake, and I can say that the, the, the traffickers that were involved were traffickers that we have known for many, many months, and we wanted to put them behind bars. We wanted to catch them in the act in order to be able to prosecute and create a case. And so I offered to go. I put on a wig, I, I look completely different, and this was the first time that I was actually on an interception case. And while I was going through it, obviously super nervous because of one, it's very tense. You're dealing with criminals and there's a lot at stake. Anything can happen and you, it's very timed. So anything that is delaying the process could ruin everything because what essentially happens in an interception moment is you go, you discuss, you barter a little bit, you ask to see the product, you pretend you don't like it. You, you really engage them to make it look like you're really trying to buy. You have a lot of money on you and then you, while you're going through this, uh, no, this kind of drama, the, the team that intercepts, so the federal police and intelligence units would appear and find us. And while I was in the waiting room of these people's homes on the outskirts of Addis, the woman that actually took care of us was a, uh, it was a woman. It was, I think, the romantic partner or the wife of the predominant um, trafficker. And she was really bossy. She was really the one that was in charge. And while the traffickers that we had been engaging with until that point were really just more concerned about who might have followed us, if anybody had seen us. And they were really vigilant about who might have been in the outskirts. And they were armed. So it was a very tense moment. And before they brought out the ivory that we were buying, um, it was again two other women that brought the ivory out. And these were very elderly women that you would never expect, like a grandmother. And they came from a different property. And that was, while I was sitting there looking at this situation, I realized really the, the women are the ones that are in control of this situation. And if anything did go wrong, the traffickers would disappear, the women would be there and they would be the least expected when intercepting. Then the third case, and for some of those that work in the illegal wildlife trade or conservation, you will know this uh, character, uh, which is uh, the Ivory Queen, the famous Ivory Queen, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, then I wanna talk about the syndicates and the people who are, are really driving the trade. So they're not the middlemen, they're not the salesmen, but they're the ones that are properly buying and then potentially reselling, but essentially buying the goods. And this case, I was in, again, in, in Ethiopia and I was in the office and I got a call from the customs and revenues officer at the airport that a large seizure had been made of ivory rings, rhino horn, elephant trinkets and so on. And that it was um, a foreign woman that was um, caught with it but she was a diplomat. So when we arrived at the airport with my team, it was a big drama because not only was she a woman that was very upset that her bag had been checked, but because she was a diplomat, it was illegal for the, the customs officer to go through her bag. And that was the focus of the conversation rather than the fact that this woman was trying to check in a luggage full of 
illegal products and wildlife products. So those are the three cases I personally was involved in and saw that really opened my mind to the world of wildlife crime and women's involvement in it. Um, here are some examples, of course, as I mentioned, the Ivory Queen, Yang Feng Lang, which is very well known um, globally. And she was a Chinese businesswoman in Tanzania who was uh, able to smuggle over 400 uh, elephants tusks, you know, a business worth $2.5 million and something that went on for years. It was expected or it was, came out that 20 years of business she was going through. And the funny thing is she was sitting on the secretary general, she was the secretary general of the Tan Tanzanian China Africa Business Council. So the people that engage in the wildlife crime, whether they're women or men, are people just like you and me. You would never say, you could never see it in their face who they might be. Um, another one that will be familiar with those who are based in South Africa are the Grunwald and Tut um, case, which is still ongoing. Um, and here it was a husband and wife who ran one of the biggest rhino poaching operations in the world and are still under, um, they're still being prosecuted, but it, it has been the trial is constantly being delayed. And that really shows how corruption and disorder in the, ju in the judicial system can impact justice being served. Um, and so now going on to look at how this is now coming to light. A lot more is being discussed, but over the last four years of working on the ground and researching, very little was being spoken about when it came to women. And it's still very, very little on mainstream media that we know. And there is very little that is guaranteed because even though the cases that I mentioned that I was involved in and that I saw, there's still only three cases um, or now maybe more, but they can't be used as a stereotype to blanket the whole continent or the illegal wildlife trade globally. But some colleagues of mine and, and amazing women, Dr. Helen Agu and Dr. Meredith Gore, are leading on this research and trying to really find ways to integrate more information about the role of women and really to try and help reduce the, the marginalization of women and the coercion of women and understanding their motivations for engagement and seeing the broader scale, kind of the macro scale that I was talking about, the social drivers as to why a woman might engage and also how we can use that knowledge to create interventions that are more effective in ending illegal wildlife trade. When we look at the two routes of involvement, predominantly we look at them choosing themselves to hunt, to collect, to trade in wildlife because they see an opportunity to exploit wild, wildlife um, as a parallel job. It's a really big industry. There's a lot of money to be made. The illegal wildlife trade is estimated to be worth 20 billion US dollars. A lot of people are making a lot of money from trafficking and destroying wildlife spaces and wildlife. And then the second one is the forced avenue. So when you have no choice but to participate because of your social relationship, the hierarchy, power, um, coercion, economic necessity, fear, there's so many things that might force you to kind of not resist and be involved in. So the motivations will differ from person to person. And really, we don't know enough about this yet. Um, Agu and Gore have looked at the theories and a lot of the literature that is available, and they've defined six different roles, primary roles within the women's roles within the illegal wildlife trade. So they can be offenders, um, such as the Ivory Queen Yang, um, defenders, such as the Black Mambas, influencers, which are also the Black Mambas, but also like the woman at site level that shared with me that she, that she knew her brother was about to commit some crimes. So she would have the power to influence or she could, she probably has tried to dissuade him from doing it. And then observers, these are everyone else, me, uh, people that work, work, activists, news agents, people that look into this, researchers, academia, and then persons harmed. There's always people that are victims of these trades. And this includes, this is included across the trade. Um, there's a lot of violence when it comes to illegal trafficking of wildlife. There's a lot of violence in any kind of illegal and illicit industry. And here we break down the structures even more because there are, like we saw, there's different types of offenders. There's different types of defenders. An offender doesn't just necessarily mean a poacher. It could be an enabler, like the ladies that I saw in the outskirts of Addis who were really just 
taking control of the situation at, at the selling point, but might have not poached the elephant themselves. And defenders, this can be anyone from staff, uh, government staff that are trying to end the trade, but police, as well as the community guardians like at the Black Mambas or criminal justice uh, professionals. And influencers are probably one of the most important because women will always fall within this category as mothers, parents, aunts, grandmothers, siblings, partners. They also can be negative influencers. They can put pressure for um, family members to poach, to provide, to engage with crime. So this is the first time that we're really delving way deeper into the different nexuses and the different roles there are within women in wildlife crime. And their motivations, a lot of them are assumptions now, and a lot of them are, come from our personal um, experiences, but there's so many different reasons why a woman might engage in crime. Um, like I mentioned, oh, the path of least resistance is a very common one, and I've seen that a lot while working. Um, it's fear, it's not having a choice, it's not having any other income as well. So if your husband or your brother or your father is bringing in income and supporting you through illegal crime, there's nothing that you can say because you have no other option. There's exploitation. And this is an important one because men know that women are not expected to be engaging in wildlife crime and in, in a majority of crime. And so we've also seen in other instances where it was the woman that was trafficking a lot of the stuff between parks, between borders. And it was by chance that she was um, caught because normally a woman wouldn't be um, searched because it would be the man that you'd fear that he's trafficking drugs or weapons or food or anything. And there's many, many reasons why they might get involved. Another interesting one is um, power. And here I look at the, I break it down into different structures. And so there's the societal roles, which I mentioned, the blind spot in the law, the, the route to gain power is really interesting because the ivory queen became a very prominent figure in, and she's, even the fact that we call her the ivory queen is quite wrong, but she became very influential. She clearly was able to supersede any laws and successfully conduct this crime for over 20 years. It obviously probably gave her a lot of power and wealth and respect in the world of the illegal wildlife trade. When we look at cultural factors, there's a lot of women in rural areas have children very young and they have to provide for them. There's lack of education, lack of opportunity. So if it means that they can better their lives in a quicker way, then they will engage with it to create a better lifestyle for them. The lack of power over their own family planning and birth control means that they won't have the ability to get a job even if they became if the opportunity presented themselves to, to them because they don't have the, the knowledge, the skills needed, and therefore you leave them no choice. And then the eco-feminism one is really interesting because women are in a position to, to know a lot about um, the environment that they're living in. They spend a lot of time outside collecting firewood, collecting water, uh, crop, putting down the crops and providing for the family. So when they realize that they have uh, the ability to be autonomous and they have control by being able to show the poachers where the elephants might be, where the rhinos might be, where the lions might be, this gives them a different level of respect, a different level of power. And then disappointment is really an important one as well, because a lot of times when I engage with communities, they talk about how wildlife conservation and park management has, has promised them so many changes and none of them have manifested. So they give up. They want to better their lives quickly. They've waited enough. They've given wildlife conservation a chance, tourism a chance, and it hasn't changed their life. And then finally, going back to what I had mentioned about the social markers and the environmental injustices that might have put them there in the first place. Um, land privatization, the lack of access, and environmental injustices when it comes to income and so on. So women in crime, in all sorts of crime, we know that there's a lower arrest rate than men, virtually for all crimes this is. And that's mainly because they probably engage in it less than men, but they also are less expected to be engaging in crime. Um, women and men um, incentives for engaging are very different and women are treated differently and more leniently. And this is something that wildlife traffickers and wildlife syndicates and drivers of the illegal wildlife trade do exploit. They know that if a woman gets caught, she'll probably be able to get off. And that's fine. We'll 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 put her. We'll throw her with the sharks, and 
again, another very common thing we're seeing is that women engage often through relationship with men, not just through coercion, but through being motivated or seeing how someone's changed their life or being exposed or um, convinced to engage through the men in their lives. The most important thing to take away is that women really are involved at all levels of wildlife crime and the, inter the interventions that we're developing to try and end the wildlife trade and wildlife crime at site level needs to take this into consideration. So much more needs to be done to understand the transit routes, how they're getting things from one place to another, how women are being um, in, um, recruited, how women are being coerced in order to protect women as well as men and try and really find solutions to this horrifying trade. So to finally, I guess, to, to kind of wrap it up, I think we really need to better understand that gender dimension in every industry, but especially in this world that where it's completely overlooked, we need to take in consideration the social structures and the hierarchies and, and the communities and societies that women belong to and how that might impact the way they engage with wildlife crime. And also, we really also need to broaden our minds. We need to consider transgender, cisgender, and intersex perspectives on wildlife crime. Wildlife crime is a global phenomenon. It isn't just an African problem. Wildlife crime happens all over the world and lots of different kinds of people engage with it. And the efforts that we are making to try and combat it need to take this into consideration. So my final thought is that our biggest challenge will be to not only defy the status quo, but to completely dismantle and rebuild it with women across races, ages, and geographies in the driver's seat. Here is a little bit more on further reading for after once this uh, talk goes online and a lot of the infographics come from these papers. Very, very interesting if you want to delve deeper into that world. And thank you so much for listening. And well done. That's um, you know, inspiring, and um, yeah, you. oh, just a lot, to, lot to take in. And um, you know, it's, it's wonderful to know that we have people like you are dedicated doing the kind of work that you are doing. Um, I'm interested specifically in South Sudan, and I see one of your your pictures, it's an aerial photograph of the elephants. Um, yeah. yeah, is there anything that you can share on us? What's happening down there? Well, South Sudan is really complicated, as you know, as a conflict-ridden country. I haven't personally been to South Sudan myself, so all of the engagement that I have with South Sudan is on email, on Zoom, and engaging with the, with the leadership at the moment has been very difficult. Uh, WCS is based in the Boma National Park, and that is really the way that I know that things are being maintained under control. Um, the wildlife luckily is in very remote areas and a lot of the conflict is not happening in the protected areas, not as of yet, not right now. Um, but it is a challenge to know where, where we're headed. You know, it's been many, many years of instability. Um, I really commend WCS for remaining there despite the many challenges that they faced, not only the, the staff that is based in, in Juba, but the many community members that have you know, try to bring about change. But it's really one of the problems with conflict is that, and, and that kind of conflict, that level of national unrest, is that it becomes very difficult to support specific regions, right? And people's opinions and people's priorities are very, are very different to wildlife conservation and communities. And one thing that I am working on though with WCS is that we've now, hopefully if everything goes well, they will be coming on to manage the Gambela National Park on the Ethiopian side of the border, uh, which is where they're based on, the, on South Sudan. So it would be a kind of a transboundary region and remit that they'd have. And on the Ethiopian side, although there is conflict and it's more, it's more common conflict, it's not violent and it's intertribal, um, we really have hope that with creating a base on the Ethiopian side in Gambela, it will allow us to have more intelligence on how to manage that region at least, and at least start off there and then expand into South Sudan, into the greater South Sudan. I mean, if I can just ask, sorry, another, just, just in reference to that, um, are you finding that with Ethiopia, I'm just thinking with the success of Ethiopian airlines and the network, has this attracted a lot of, is it a gateway? I mean, there's a lot of like with the ivory and what have you, is it coming, is it coming in through the borders? Absolutely. So it's not necessarily from Ethiopia, it's from other African countries, yeah. 
Yes, so one thing that is completely also overlooked is how important Ethiopian Airlines and Ethiopia and Addis Ababa Boli International is as a major hub for trafficking of ivory and all sorts of animals. Um, specifically because we're the only country where there's a direct flight from West and Central Africa and then direct, stops in, in Addis and then goes straight to the, Middle East, to the Middle East, to the Far East, to Europe, anywhere in the world, you just have to transit through Addis. And so it is a major, major trafficking hub indeed. Thank you, Greta. Um, uh, Rod, um, I just want to ask Paul to keep his eye on the chat. Over to you, Rod. Um, hi, the next question we have is uh, Samantha Sotoli. Um, thanks for that question, Campbell. Um, those questions, Campbell is, is going to come back, by the way. I just warn you, Greta. <laughs> he hasn't finished yet. Um, but uh, yeah, we have uh, Samantha, if you would like to ask your question. Thank you, Rod. And thank you, Greta, for that wonderful talk. Thank um, you. I, I was actually uh, like gasping the whole time you were speaking because my master's thesis was, is very similar to the first part of your talk. I was researching militarization uh, in the communities of the Kruger, Nas uh, Kruger National Park. Um, so even the images you were showing, I was like, that's my thesis. <laughs> <laughs> have you finished yeah. it already? Sorry? Are you, are you currently doing it or are you finished with your thesis? Oh, I, I'm, I'm done with my thesis. I'm not doing my PhD uh, in a similar topic. But um, okay, so related to my PhD, my, my question is, is there a large number of young people or young women that you see within the, the, the international wildlife trade? And what is their role um, if, if, if you've come across young people? Yes, in fact, a majority of the women that I mentioned in my stories were not much older than me, so between 25 and 35, um, as, except those elderly women that I told you. Uh, at the site level, you know, e Ethiopia, which is where I, I conduct a lot of my illegal wildlife trade work, um, Ethiopia is a very young country. Uh, we have a major majority of our population is under the age of 40. So th they're very young and a lot of them engage in these kind of crimes or are, are more enticed to know more about wildlife crime because there's a lack of opportunities and jobs. Um, and it's something that more recently we've really been targeting to try and mass scale um, pro provide job opportunities in order for them to have some way of not engaging in, in illegal uh, criminal activity. Yes. Okay. Thank Thanks, you. Rita. Paul, anything in the chat? No, the chat looks pretty clear. Um, lots of comments and congratulations, but no questions. Okay, thank you, Paul. Um, any sure, other we've questions? got more questions. I mean, uh, there's um, there's uh, uh, certainly people that uh, have uh, an affinity with community. Amy Young, I was about to mention your name and your hand popped up. <laughs> Amy? Perfect. Great. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, as we spoke a little bit briefly earlier, Yes, I'm involved with the human dimension of conservation and community-based conservation. Uh, so one of the aspects I studied in school was the illegal wildlife trade and poaching. So I am one of the ones that was more aware of women's involvement. Yeah. But, uh, fascinating to hear the details. I, yeah. I, all the details that you've provided were new to me. So fantastic. that's fascinating. And I, now I'm going to get back online and do some uh, searches for some peer-reviewed journal articles. Absolutely. And I'm glad because I think sharing the details is what really, really stirs that deeper aspect of wondering or kind of engaging with the fact that, you know, we are really as many as men. So it's impossible that a trade that is that big is completely exclusive of women. And mm -hmm. But for me as well, the first time that I encountered it, I, you know, it was really a light bulb moment. It was a shocking moment. Um, and it has completely catapulted the way I engage with women, especially when doing community work, because I instantly realized the power that they have and the knowledge that they know. So when I'm engaging with them, when I'm building uh, relationships, it's with that in my head now. It's the fact that if I am able to get you to trust me, you'll, you are a, a treasure box because you know everything about how the community runs. You know everything about how people are coming into your community, convincing your community to engage in wildlife crime and then how it's getting out. And you might be able to help me figure it all out. And essentially that's what I want to do. I want to be able to employ these 
these breadwin these women that have so much knowledge and um, because you, you it, the one thing that's important to state is that as as long as women and men are, that are helping you um, combat illegal crime are doing it for free they're able they're co they're coercible they are able they are able to be exploited they are able to be um, violently um, prosecuted by their own community for sharing information. So you are actually endangering them. But as soon as you give them a safety spot, uh, an, an income earner, you give them a way to keep them safe, but are able to inform you, then all of a sudden you have something big, you're onto something more. And you're not only extracting information for free. And I think that's yeah. so important for people who work with communities to understand that just because they're doing the right thing doesn't mean that they don't need food on the table. They, they might be telling you all about wildlife crime and still selling rhino horns on the side, you know, because mm -hmm. of the realities of their life and mm -hmm. what they need to do to, to survive. And I think I want to challenge all conservationists to think about that and to always reevaluate your privileged position as someone that doesn't need to engage in dangerous activities or criminal activities. And mm -hmm. everybody that we've ever apprehended, um, I like to have conversations with them because they are human after all. <laughs> and yeah. I think it's a really interesting, and maybe one day I will write a book about all the poachers or the traffickers that I've sat down and just talked because at, at the end of the day, when they're not carrying weapons and when they're no longer dangerous to you, when they're just at a table and there's police so they would never do anything to you, you realize they're just people. A lot of them are just people. They're criminals, nonetheless, but they have stories. They have families. They have, you know, they have, they have a history as to why and how they got here. And that, to me, is key information that we need in order to better understand the trade. Yeah, and that actually reminds me of the first, well, not the first thing, but one, one of the many things that jumped out in your presentation was when you were describing how you could only work for four or five hours because of the heat, but then you still spent your time you know, with the community for the other hours. And that's when you get more of those little nuggets of information when you Absolutely, yeah. Um, so that, I, I love that, again, community. Um, yes. Then once your YouTube is posted, I'm going to go back and write down the quote that you had at the end, but it was about uh, dismantling the problem and rebuilding it. And yes. that's obviously a, a huge underscore for me because it's such a large problem it does have to be dismantled from the inside. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank well, you. Um, thank you, Amy. that was fantastic. Thank you. Uh, Greta, uh, Veronica Kosana has had a question and she, she asks, um, forensics, forensics have shown to be answers to catching criminals. Do we, conservation, do we have conservation forensics that work closely to these cases, collecting DNA and everything? As you mentioned, going undercover and, and if yes, which part of the studies does do one have to does one have to take? So I presume that that means how how do we make sure that forensics is involved? Is it involved? And then how does one get involved if they're interested? So thank you very much for that question. It's interesting you mention it because this year in January, just before lockdown, we conducted. I was able to conduct the first ever in-country forensic examination of a rhino horn that we seized in Ethiopia. And in fact, I will share with Leadership of Conservation when that talk goes on, probably around November, we're doing a, a joint talk about that with Interpol. Um, but forensics is very, very important in, especially once you've seized an item, to understand the story of that item. So in order to verify that one, it is actually a wildlife product. So a lot of times, because of the lack of, of capacity in these developing countries, like my country, like Ethiopia, we don't have the capacity to differentiate between a rhino horn and a really big bullhorn or, a, uh, you know, at the site level, there's a lot of confusion and traffickers use this to their advantage. They are able to get out on bail. They're able to create stories and say, no, this is not a rhino horn. This is a buffalo horn. This is is, uh, something else you know and and because people are not confident and they don't want to prosecute someone uh, wrongfully they they're too afraid to, to take it to trial and so forensics at that level is crucial because you have an a seized item and you're able to prove what it is it will help the case tremendously um, but when it comes to forensic uh, evaluation at site level it's incredibly difficult because forensics requires you to be 
on site within a few hours of the crime being committed. You need fresh blood samples, fresh carcass samples. You need to be able to get to the location and that in itself is a huge challenge. You might not know where that carcass or that animal has been killed. And this is the big problem with wildlife crime is that there's no witnesses. A lot of times the crime happens and nobody's there to witness it other than the poachers. So in order you, for you to understand better, you need to build back a puzzle with no evidence and no idea who committed it or how they did it and who they were working with. So forensic analysis is very useful in a, let's say controlled uh, setting, I would say, when we, we want to understand better specific information about the animal. But it, is, it has proven to be very, very difficult when it comes to the fact that it's such a long trade. The trafficking route is huge from the poacher to the buyer. There's so many countries, so many levels and so many you know, blankets that we have to get through. Um, and forensics until now hasn't proven to be that successful. Um, but when it comes to identifying wildlife um, issues at a prosecutor level, at criminal justice level, it's very, very important. And we are rolling out programs that build the capacity in country to give um, opportunities for people to be employed. So the avenue to study would really be just forensic, forensic analysis, forensic investigations and then there's so many different aspects to that in itself so looking into the broader conservation uh, links to forensics and seeing what might interest you what would be the best avenue i think thank Fantastic. you greta um just a question greta um i think i had a earlier message that one of your colleagues might be on that you would like to link or bring in comments uh, is yes, I, I'm going to try and look for them if they're here. Um, uh, what is the name? Alice, but I think she's left. Alice, my friend Elisa's on. I can see my friend is on. I Lisa see Timothy and I see a few friends. My colleague is not on at the moment. I think she probably okay. had to make, make dinner or something. <laughs> okay. That's all good. And then... Uh, it's a question from my side, if I may. Yes. Um, in your studies, have you found sort of a pattern in terms of women being coerced or forced to do this, whether it is more social, religious, um, philosophical status? Um, is there any pattern in that, or is it just uh, uh, depend on the circumstances? Um. Let me just, I'm going to share my screen again, because I'll show you something. Um, share screen. Because that will help. Um, so let's go back. So here, so the motivations is what we're really looking for, right? And okay. it's been coerced. So a lot of times, personally, yes. I, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's someone with a gun behind their back saying, if you don't do this, I'm going to kill you. But it's more about the social structure and hierarchies that are found in Ethiopian culture. So the fact that a woman will never speak back to her partner or her father. And therefore, whatever is asked of her a lot of times if she speaks out, she will pay for it, whether it might be with regards to violence or there will be a consequence. So this respect of the elderly, this respect of the leader in your family, the leader in community, I've seen that a lot. Women don't have uh, such a vocal space in, in society in a lot of the areas that I'm working on. But if we look at all the different reasons why a woman might, might engage, you can also see here this is one of the interesting ones that I've seen a lot, the pressure to provide for the family. So what I mean by that is that the woman herself is pressuring her husband, her brother, her family member to engage in wildlife crime because she's seen the very rapid income that it brings and how it's relatively not risky. All you've got to do is go kill an animal and you can make it look like an accident. And then then and they're pests anyway for a majority of these women because they're very dangerous elephants. I always say, I don't know who coined the, the term gentle giant, but every time I've come into, into contact with elephants, at least in Ethiopia, it's been very, very scary and very dangerous because they are also protecting their young. They're also protecting their, their families and they want to make sure that there's distance. So they have, I have noticed and from conversations with communities that women will be very quick when they trust me to say, 
well, you know, if it's just one and I get all this money, it's fine, right? I mean, it's just one, you know, there's many. And so they might be putting pressure on their scouts because the scout wants them to have a big family and all of a sudden they can't afford it. So it's up to him now to find the money. Um, another reason that they might um, get involved, which I find very interesting, is this part, the gaining control and autonomy. A lot of women that I engaged with mentioned that one of the things they'd want to change is to have the respect that men have and the respect even when they see me and I spend a lot of time with them they always ask me well you see you you have a different role you people respect you men don't speak uh, down on you and they work with you and I want to do that and so having an aspiration to be respected to have autonomy to be able to provide for yourself I can imagine would lead me to do whatever it takes to get there and if it make, means that I need to become uh, an illegal wildlife trafficker to be kind of a partner in crime for my husband and show him how I can be more useful than just a wife or, or a mother, I would be, I, if I put myself in those positions, if that's my biggest aspiration, I would do whatever it takes. So I think that those are two interesting ones. And then the coercion is very common and that's not just with wildlife crime. So gender-based violence is a very big problem that we see in everything. So you know, like I said, a lot of these men are, are mm. um, armed and scary people and they will do whatever it takes to protect their identity, even if that means throwing their wives, sisters, mothers under the bus, because these are tra dangerous people that are very important in the link of the wildlife trade. And if it means that they need to take care of themselves, they often will. And we've seen that in interception where when sometimes, for example, interception goes wrong and it's taken too long for the federal police to come. So the, the trafficking network is aware that something's weird because we're not willing to give money because that, it has to happen in that exchange moment. And therefore they're getting nervous and they're becoming aggressive and they're making uh, aggressive comments and they're looking around and instantly they're going, they disappear. They're, they will not care who comes in and, and catches their wives or whoever else they have recruited there, but they're going to take care of themselves and disappear. So that shows me that a lot of these women are put in unsafe places and there is nobody taking care of them. Nobody was there saying, come with me, I'll make sure your identity is covered. Um, so that shows me that the women were always left behind and the men, one, were, were armed so they could protect themselves. Women were never armed. And the women were often just left alone um, if, if they fled. Mm -hmm. So those are the kind of the ideas and the, the notions that I've noticed. Thanks for that, Greta. Chris, um, um, we've got a couple of questions come in from chat. Uh, actually, three different questions from three different people. So the first one for Greta is from Sibyl, Sibyl Guzman. And she says, perhaps get in touch with Ryan Blumenthal from with Autopsy Life in the Trenches with a forensic and as a forensic pathologist in Africa. Even though his work is obviously around humans, he might be able to give some advice about the forensics. Fantastic, thank you, Veronica. Yep, and uh, uh, that's actually from Sibiu. And then, um, oh, Tassid yeah. Dadi, um, what about species such as Ethiopian wolves? Are they also smuggled or mostly threatened by habitat loss? So Ethiopian wolves are the most endangered canid in the world there's less than 400 individuals. So they are very much threatened by their habitat. I would say the predominant threat to the wolf is the encroachment of habitat and the pressures of canine distemper and kind of life, livestock grazing and kind of the pathogens and diseases that might be mixed between wolves and dogs and livestock. But there is, and we have noticed an increase of threat of trafficking. When it, you don't really see what, um, wolf skin being trafficked or you don't seize it. But an interesting thing happened actually at the beginning of COVID, which has never happened. And a wolf in the Syrian mountains was shot um, and was found by a scout. And luckily for the Ethiopian wolf project, which are an incredible team of individuals, they were able to arrive and take care of the wolf and rehabilitate the wolf in one of, in the Born Free Foundation Center actually, and, and rehabilitate it. But, but we've never heard of, of wolves being shot. If they ever had been poached, you'd never find the carcass because there is myths and talks that in the past, especially in Sudan, the Ethiopian wolf skin is believed to um, 
provide armor from bullets, imagine. Um, so there used to be, back in the day, there was talks about, there was a lot of trafficking of Ethiopian wolf skin, uh, skins through Sudan, through to Sudan because of this, this belief, this mythical um, belief that it would protect from a bullet wound. But then recently we had, yeah, we, we had a, a wolf being shot. So I do believe that this probably has some kind of reigniting of this belief or some kind of form of wanting to traffic it. We don't know why they left the, uh, the animal behind, but probably because it ran quite far before it, it settled. Um, but there are threats to them for sure. Okay, and, and thank you, that's great. And one last question from Riet Leguile Molwantwa. Out of all the work that you have covered or taken part of, has it always been that women take part in the illegal trade of rhino horns and elephant tusks only? No, absolutely not. I, so I have encountered women in the trafficking trade of cheetah live pets. This is very, very common in fact, because um, cheetahs have to be removed from their so they need to be stolen from their dens if they're very small while their mother is out hunting. And it, usually the trafficker, the, the poacher or the one that's stealing them will take them to their home where they have their wife and their kids and everyone else. And it's women that take care of the cheetahs until it's time for them to, be, to go on the treacherous journey to the Middle East. So we've definitely encountered women engaged in this and also with um, other skins, so leopard skins, online sales of ivory and all sorts of wildlife products. So of course in the past ivory and all sorts of horns and even uh, trophy um, like stuffed trophies of animals used to be commonly sold and in fact a lot of the online sales on Facebook that I've intercepted or, or engaged with to try and understand it's always women that are trying to get rid of these things although often when we target them they know that it's illegal they're not allowed to sell ivory even if they had come into it came into the position their possession legally they can't sell it they have to kind of come they have to give it up to the to the authorities or they can just keep it um but selling it makes it illegal so we've seen women engage on all on all uh, species yeah rod any last okay. questions um no we've got campbell scott wants to ask a question but i just want to make a comment in in zanga sanga we've had uh, the the women do a lot of the the transporting of the ammunition for the bushmeat poachers. The, the men never never carry it. The women always carry it. So uh, that that was brought about. We, we, we picked that up because of uh, Rory Young, uh, who gave the talk last week. Um, uh, their dog squad pick, picked up this fact that it's the woman who's, ca who's carrying this ammunition. So the woman is there. Anyway, over to Campbell for his uh, next. Uh, well, thanks. Um, I'm just interested in um, the hyenas, you know, and the communities and community con conservation. It's just, you know, obviously um, Ethiopia has uh, quite a reputation with, um, you know, quite close presence of, of large uh, carnivores. I mean, I'm actually working in Addis at the moment up in the mountains. And I mean, there's every day there's spoil of hyenas. But it's quite interesting, though, is that you know, coming, I live in South Africa, I actually live close to the Kruger National Park. But I've traveled extensively. Um, and you look at these examples, say, in, in India with leopard and what have you. But I mean, is this a, a cultural aspect? How does, how, does one, how does a community evolve where they tolerate such close proximity of these you know, large carnivores? You know, it's quite fascinating. It's not just an isolated incident. I mean, it's, it's actually, there's, there's many, um, um, in fact, you can go now in Ethiopia. I haven't been yet, but I obviously want to, but I've read up quite a lot about it, but it's, it's fascinating. How does that evolve? <laughs> You know, no, I, I'm not really sure. I think, to be honest, I think most communities, when there wasn't broader pressures as they are now, um, they live, when, at least when I speak with communities about, especially with chiefs that have been around for a long time, um, it's, you know, the conflict of human and wildlife is something that's really been driven by the broader pressures of development, industrialization, where we're really driving wild animals into spaces that they never would go. And even that means into communities, because communities have, especially in Ethiopia, been in areas for far longer than parks have and any kind of development. So why has now this become a problem? It's because on the other end of the spectrum, we're pushing everything closer to communities and developing and, and really just the kind of um, uh, segmenting areas of corridors of habitats. 
and not allowing that wildlife to live the way it did. And communities always say this. So in the past, elephants didn't come to raid our crops. They would pass by here, but they wouldn't come and, and create conflict. And a lot of that is because there's no other way for them to get through. Um, and same with carnivores. Carnivores are, as I'm sure you know, if you work with them, is that they very rarely attack humans. They, they, they are very, the, the human scent is predator to a carnivore, to, an, to a lion, to a cheetah, to a leopard to a hyena. We, we, we really have to, um, one, they either have to be very, very hungry and you have to be alone uh, or a child for them to, to try and hunt you. But in a, in a community setting, they're not just going to wander into a community. You know, that is very rare. And especially in countries like Ethiopia. So I think the tolerance really comes from the fact that for many years there was balance. There was a kind of a harmony between the animals and the wild animals and the communities. But now in a country that is over 110 million people and with the governments trying to cater to that number very rapidly without really conducting the land use planning assessments that need to be with regards to corridors and um, historical ranges. We're having a lot of issues with this with regards to elephants. Elephants, as you know, no matter what you put in, in, in front of it, if that was a, its historical range, it will go through that path and it will wreak havoc in the way, you know? So trying to lobby for governments to understand that these historical communities and, and habitats for especially the dangerous uh, species such as predators, elephants, and more aggressive or behaviorally more challenging buffaloes and so on, to really take into consideration that for many years there is tolerance because we didn't drive them into small spaces and, and expect them to thrive. They had far broader areas and habitats and therefore there was no conflict. And so I think that's what it is. I think it's just really the common issue we're seeing all over the world. I'm going to go out on a limb here, but I think you guys in Ethiopia have something special. I think there's a relationship there that needs to be studied. Um, and I've never seen it anywhere else. Um, it's unusual and it's, and it's widespread. Um, you know, there's a number of, of, of communities yeah. today, tonight, that are living with these large carnivores. And a, and a hyena is not a small animal by any leap of imagination. And, mm -hmm. you know, you know as, and as a South African and living close to these conservation areas, we, that, that could never exist here. I mean, the, that kind of population. Yeah, that's, that's, that's very true. I think, I think it's the, again, it's the rhetoric that's been developed for many years in South Africa, where it's protected area and people, you know, and yeah. it's been that way for, for as long as ever, you know, you've really defined the fortress, like in South Africa, fortress conservation still stands. People do not live in protected areas. Everyone lives on the outskirts and we divide them. In Ethiopia, we don't have that. There is no such thing. We don't have fortresses, we don't have fences. You know, there are communities living in parks. There are uh, wildlife animals that are, we know our hab their habitat range is completely out of the park. So this reality, I think, informs the way we engage with wildlife, you know? So if you see a uh, hyena in Addis, which you do in the outskirts of Addis, that's just normal, you know? The hyenas have come down from the mountains and they're, they're scavenging. And the same in any of the parks, yeah. you know, because a lot of the communities actually are within the park. And there's only one park in the whole country where there's no non settlement in the park. And that's only because of the fact that it's so dense and it's impossible for them to live properly within the park borders. So they, they live closer to water spaces and the lakes and areas where they can cultivate. Um, so I think that's probably why, and that's a good point. It's the fact that for, his, for so many decades and, and centuries, we've always lived in, unis, in, in unison with them. Well, we thank learning. you very much, Greta. Yeah. Scott, thank you uh, for your always very interesting questions. Um, we're now getting to the point where we will have to close the show. Yes. But I would like to ask anyone of the women who, who are on tonight, we have not known Greta before met her. Any one of you who would like to just unmute yourself and woman to woman, just give Greta a thanks. No. Anyone? Let's find anyone who's got the courage to unmute themselves and say, I don't bite, I promise. 
<laughs> Congratulations. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Hey. <laughs> no, you, don't, you don't have to switch on your screen. You can just say it. <laughs> Come on, uh, Pippa Hara. Why don't you say something? Yes. Um, am, I, am I muted? No. You're ready to go. We hear you perfectly. Uh, Rodney, I, I knew you would pick on me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and you always only see the top of your head. You need to tip your computer screen down a bit. Yeah, I, yes, I need somebody to show me how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, yeah, it, a, a, a fascinating presentation and quite a few people have said eye-opener and it is, it, it's certainly an eye-opener. Okay. Um, yeah, my my concern is, you know, how's it going? How is it going to? Where's it going to go? What, what, how's it going to end? <laughs> when when will it end? But the more exposure there is, the more awareness that there's created, you know. Um, and women obviously do have a very important role to play. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm. Thank, Thank you, Papa. Thank you very much. And. Uh, yeah. Uh, let's un uh, well before we unmute and give Greta a last round of applause. Just a reminder that uh, coming Thursday uh, we will be listening to Moses Silabatsu on the dwindling paradise, that being the Kalari, and our failures, and also chances to maybe rectify our failures. So you're reminded of that talk. Let's all unmute and uh, let's give this young woman a very great, very great round of applause. Well done, Greta. Thank you so much. And thank you to your parents. Thank you to my parents. That was amazing. That was amazing. <laughs>